Okay, today she's on the ball. Okay. All right, good. Um, before we get started, any questions? Okay, good. If there are no questions, then I'm going to, going to go ahead and jump us to chapter three, not jump us, but proceed us to chapter three. And um, let me go ahead and put my computer in tablet mode and get all these wires out of the way. And then uh, put my screen in full screen mode. Okay, good. And you can see that we're going to start to look at chapter three. And uh, really, you can take, even though they've broken these into three parts, this is all one big area on the exam. Managerial cost accounting constitutes about 15 points on the exam. This combined with variance analysis that we'll get into a little bit later are probably uh, the two heaviest sections on the entire exam. So you've got to know your cost, managerial accounting, um, 15 points on the exam, and then we'll talk about performance management, and we'll probably get into that next time. That tends to be uh, fairly light, even though they have a kind of a big chunk of pages here dedicated to that. Uh, not a real, real heavy area, but definitely we want to spend some time uh, reviewing our cost accounting, our managerial accounting. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's start to take a look now at um, module one. Okay, and the first thing we're going to talk about is cost behavior. Okay, and so we're going to take a look at cost behavior and cost objects or cost objectives. Okay, so let's just take a look. And you can see this chart down here, this little sort of Venn diagram thing. And a lot of times where students struggle when they're first learning managerial accounting and when we're reviewing it here for the CPA exam is the different names they give to things that essentially constitute the same thing. Okay, for example, we have what? We have direct materials, we have direct labor. Now, uh, those are obviously what? Direct cost, right? Now, direct cost is a cost that is fairly easily traceable to the product. When I say easy, I don't mean easy from the standpoint of the CPA exam question. I mean easy from the standpoint of our cost gathering system. It's going to be fairly straightforward as to how you gather costs your direct materials, direct labor. Somebody works three hours on constructing a table. You know, they work three hours, they make, you know, $40 an hour to do that work. Three times 40 is how we would calculate the direct labor. Direct materials, we know how much lumber was used in producing that table, whatever, assuming a wooden table there, that's fairly easy to trace to the product, okay? Now, we also have factory overhead. And factory overhead is considered an indirect cost. Okay, now what happens? What do we mean by indirect? Indirect by definition means that it is too difficult to trace the cost of your indirect cost directly to the product. Okay, that's the term indirect. So our electricity bill, our glue that we may even use to put together that table is difficult to trace those costs directly. We call those indirect costs, okay? Now notice we also have some words up here, prime cost and conversion cost, okay? And notice that our direct materials and our direct labor are considered prime cost. Our factory overhead is considered a conversion cost as we convert direct materials into product and what our direct labor is also considered a conversion cost. So direct labor, you can see in this little Venn diagram thing, actually end up doing what? Actually end up um, falling into both categories. Notice that what? All of these costs here, our direct materials, our direct labor, our factory overhead are all considered um, product costs. Now we're going to see that some costs 
are considered to be period costs, but our direct materials, our direct labor, our factory overhead are all considered product costs. Now, what we're showing you here with these arrows is how costs flow through our accounting system. And we're gonna actually look at some T accounts a little bit later, but we have what? We have materials, materials get requisitioned into work in progress. We perform some direct labor that goes into our work in progress. We apply our overhead that goes into work in progress. As those items are completed, they move out of work in progress to finished goods where they sit there and wait to be uh, purchased or finally uh, issued if we're doing that on a contract basis to somebody's specific uh, requirements. They're finally picked up. They go from finished goods to cost of goods sold. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just take a look and let's take a look at these different items. Product cost. Okay. And our product costs are what? Our inventory and the cost of goods manufactured. Now, let's just go ahead and take a look at the next page as we start to consider the cost of goods manufactured, or let's just consider here our uh, product costs, and we'll come back. I mean, excuse me, our period costs, those are our product costs. Um, components of our, here it is, components of our product cost include our direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead applied. So we just saw that on the previous page. And um, these three items are also, AKA, also known as cost of goods manufactured. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and flashcard that and make sure we're clear that what our cost of goods manufactured, okay, right here, are also these components combined. The cost of goods manufactured include our direct materials, direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead. Period costs are costs that are expensed in the period that they are incurred. So components of our period costs include our selling and our administrative expenses, okay? And those are going to be expensed as they are incurred. So go ahead and flashcard that period costs are expensed in the period in which they are incurred. Flashcard that. Flashcard, include that flashcard, the components. And uh, notice that our non-manufacturing costs down here can be both direct and, um, um, well, those are just our components of our product costs. Never mind. Those are just components of our product, of our period costs, and those are expensed as incurred. Okay. So we've got what? We've got two types of costs here. We've got our product cost. Okay, and our product costs do what? Our product costs, don't forget, first go where? First appear on the balance sheet, and then they go to what? They go to the income statement, and they go to the income statement in the form of cost of goods sold, right? We've got our period cost, Okay. And period costs do what? Period costs just go straight to the income statement. They're expensed in the period they are incurred. Selling, like advertising costs, are what? Our, um, uh, our CEO salary, things like administrative costs, et cetera. Okay. So with that, little reminder of the names and the different uh, ways these costs are treated, Let's go ahead and see if we can figure out, and let's answer the question first from the standpoint of which of these would be product cost, okay? Let's just do this exercise together. So uh, what do you think? How about wages for factory employees, product or period? Product. 
Good, that's gonna be a product cost. Okay, I'll put a check next to all the product costs. How about wage accounting department? I'll put a blue check and a red check, how about that? Red for product, red for period. Looks like it's gonna be one of those days where I'm gonna be saying all the things opposite of the way I wanna say them and blue for product. Okay, good. So how about wages for the accounting department? Period. Product? Period. Good, that's gonna be period cost. Good, how about sales and Period. period. Good. How about raw materials purchased? Product. 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 That's going to be product. Good. How about general administrative? Period. 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 Okay, good. And they had to do it every other, so I got to keep changing the pen. How about manufacturing overhead? Uh, product. Product. That's going to be product cost. Good. So make that blue. And how about interest expense? Allocated between the two. No, not necessarily. Interest expense, okay. The fact that they call it interest expense is pretty period. much it's a period. Period. Uh, um, you know, if you borrowed money for raw materials, you may want to try to somehow, you know, allocate some of that interest to that. But for the purposes of the CPA exam, you're pretty shit safe calling that a period cost. Um, not only is interest expense generally a period cost, it's typically non-operating. Um, so the idea being that a company shouldn't borrow money to operate from period to period. So period uh, interest expense is usually treated as something that's um, not unusual, because th that's not what I'm trying to say, but it's something that is not even considered part of normal operations generally. So that's going to be treated as a period expense for the CPA exam anyway. So for the CPA exam also, if you've got commissions on sales, which would be tied to a product, uh, those would still be period costs because they're just part of sales expense and considered administrative and that kind of thing. Well, I agree with everything you said, except that they still are product costs. They are not a product cost on it by any definition. By any definition, okay. Even if they're if even if they are tied to a product. Well, they're tied to a period because you're trying to match the commission with the period of sale. Okay, got That's it. Period cost. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, and here's the solution, right, guys. We kind of use the checks, whatever. Okay, all right, good. Now you come over and you take a look at our direct cost, and our direct costs are easily traceable. Guys, we already know because we saw it from that previous chart. That's what direct materials, direct labor. Oh, hello. Okay, there it is right there. I'm going faster than the book here. Okay, we don't need necessarily examples. It's just easily traced to the product. When I say easily, I don't mean from the standpoint of CPA exam easy. I mean easily from the standpoint of our cost accounting system. Okay. Indirect costs by definition, okay, indirect costs by definition are not easily, easily traceable. You know, you're a sandwich shop, you're making sandwiches. You're not going to trace the cost of mayonnaise to a sandwich. That's going to be too difficult. And sometimes students will say, well, you know, what if they have this sophisticated accounting system that measures mechanically mayonnaise? Well, look, if they figure out a way of making it easy, then I guess it can be treated as a direct cost. But generally things like lubricants, mayonnaise, glue, the electricity bill, the depreciation on the factory building is going to be too difficult to trace to a, a product. Now, when we look at our indirect costs, there are three categories really. Indirect materials, for example, the glue that I'm talking about, the oil to keep the machines oiled up. I don't know, obviously I have no experience in a manufacturing operation, or at least not for some time. I worked in a factory one summer. Uh, my dad got me a job working in a factory. And I, think, I, don't, I think they were making parts for computers. And I worked one summer there between my junior and senior year of high school. 
And I think my dad's intent there worked because I immediately ended that summer saying, guess what, dad, after college, I'm after high school, I'm going to college because I knew that I was not made for that job. I remember one time having to put some caustic stuff on some parts and I'm sitting there and all this stuff's flying up in my face. And I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for at least an hour now. And I turn around and look at the clock. It's been 10 minutes. Okay. So I knew that wasn't, I wasn't cut out for that. So anyway, but um, my point being that things like that caustic material, it would be difficult to trace the cost of that to any one product. That would be an example of an indirect cost. Okay. Then what? Indirect labor. What happens? You have a supervisor and the supervisor runs from one sandwich maker to the next and hey a little less meat on that one hey you left out the cheese on this one hey you just used the wrong bread on that one well what happens you sit there and you can't really keep track of how much time they spend on each sandwich and so that would be considered an indirect cost because of the difficulty of tracing it. so we've got what we've got indirect material indirect labor those are obviously indirect Hello, they have the word indirect in front of them. And then we have other indirect costs, okay? Now let's go ahead and think about some examples of other indirect costs, okay? So how about depreciation? Depreciation on what? Maybe the machinery? The equipment. Yeah, on factory and equipment, right? Factory and factory equipment, not depreciation. You got to be careful. Um, that says factory plus equipment. You got to be careful because what? The depreciation on the administrative building is going to be considered what? A selling and administrative cost. But depreciation on the factory building, like Matthew said, the equipment, that's going to be depreciation. I mean, excuse me, other indirect costs. Uh, what else? Maybe utilities. Util utilities on the factory. Everything, again, has to be related to the factory. But yeah, utilities, good. What else? Rent. Um... Did you say rent? Yes. Yeah, rent, if we're renting the factory building or we're renting some additional space for our, again, not our administrative functions, but our manufacturing functions, good. How about insurance on the factory building? What about warehousing? Will that be, I mean, or, or uh, yeah. Uh, warehousing, okay. Okay, again, like get into rent, but yeah, warehousing. Okay, what else? How about property taxes? What about any kind of legal compliance cost associated with the manufactured goods? You know, like workers' comp for the factory workers. I mean, that's insurance, but I mean, you know, the all the legal compliance costs associated with keeping the factory operational and in compliance, you know, EPA stuff, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and include that. We'll call it taxes and fees or something. Okay. But um, I just want to say when you said, you know, if we happen to pay something that is part of our payroll costs and we can come up with a cost for direct labor, hour or something, then you could consider that direct if it's related to our direct labor. But if it's something that's related to uh, something indirect, yeah, then, you, you know, and again, it gets into that e ease of tracing. I haven't seen too many questions that consider that, but it could be, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So they give us, and I kind of was writing here on the side here, uh, things that ended up being in the example just to uh, entertain you, okay? But those are there in that example. But bottom line, we have what? We have three types of indirect costs. We have indirect labor, indirect materials, those are obvious. And then our third type are going to be the others, okay? And the way I kind of 
help you remember the others. I don't know if you ever saw this movie called The Others. It's like this really scary movie with Nicole Kidman in it. So just think of the others so that you don't forget that those items are also indirect. Okay. I have a question. So calculate the indirect cost since it's very hard to, um, to, to estimate how much. Is it usually percentage of like? Well, it's applied. It's applied to work in process and it's applied to work in process using some rate that is uh, predetermined at the beginning of the year. And then anytime a job uses whatever the driver is, often direct labor hours, we apply those costs to that job using that predetermined overhead rate. And we're gonna get into that here in a couple of seconds. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Professor, now, uh, Professor, what about some investments or something like that? Uh, we were learning in the first chapter about risks such as business risks, uh, you know, um, strike risks or something like that. Uh, any sort of in investments or instruments purchased to hedge those risks, would that be also added to these kind of costs? I don't think so. I mean, you can get as sophisticated as you want here on this kind of stuff. I suppose you could try to allocate those kind of costs to uh, products or, you know, um, different programs that you have, but I, that's starting to sound awfully administrative to me. And sometimes, you know, you get into a situation where if those costs don't really change from period to period significantly, then you might as well go ahead and treat those as a period cost, right? Right, right, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, remember, we're talking about accounting here, guys. Okay, maybe I should back up a little bit. We're kind of pushing ourselves a little bit back into financial accounting, even though it's on the BEC part of the exam. So I probably should have said that at the beginning. What we're doing is we're figuring out how to take these costs through our accounting system. I mean, that's really what we're doing, right? Because ultimately, we're going to have what? We're going to have inventory showing on our balance sheet. We're going to have cost of goods sold. Ugh. It's going to be one of those nights. Cost of goods sold sitting there on my income statement. So we're back to, I say back as though we have been talking about that many times in this course, but we're now in a financial accounting mode, aren't we? But now instead of being a retail entity, which is what we considered quite a bit on the FAR exam. Now we're talking about what? A manufacturing entity. Okay. Okay, good. Go ahead and please flashcard the definition of prime cost and conversion cost in case they ask you something stupid on the exam. Okay. When I say stupid, I mean, who cares which is prime, which is conversion? But, it, you know, the exam could ask you that. Um, and I want you to be able to, uh, you know, have that flashcard, okay? Now, we had the question, um, Abby gave us the question, well, how do you apply the overhead, okay? And that's what's right here, okay? Now, what we need to do is we need to take our, and they're calling it budgeted. I'm going to call it estimated, but a budget is an estimate, okay? But we take our estimated, our budgeted overhead cost. We divide that by whatever our estimated cost driver is. That gives us, and I'm going to put the word predetermined, even though the exam may not call it that. I want you to think of it as a predetermined overhead rate. And the reason I'm calling it predetermined, we haven't produced one item yet. We've sat there, we've estimated what our overhead costs, we've estimated whatever our cost driver is going to be. Could be direct labor hours, could be direct labor dollars, kind of trying to get to Kathy's point. If you use direct labor dollars, now you're bringing in certain 
fringe benefits and these kind of things that could be paying to our employees that we can consider part of their wage. Um, and then once you get that overhead rate, that predetermined overhead rate, I'll put PD here, predetermined overhead rate, you multiply it by the actual cost driver and then that will be the amount of overhead that you will apply and you will apply that to what apply that to work in progress and you do that because it's too difficult to trace overhead directly to each job, job. so you apply it based on your predetermined overhead rate and then the amount of that driver that that particular uh, job uses up. So what I want you to do is put C, multiple choice question, zero, five, three, two, one. And that question guys is on page 13, okay? So what I wanna do is rather than kind of jump into the software and try to find it. Let me just jump to page 13 here. Okay, and let's go ahead. And uh, I wanna do this one together, okay? I think you might be doing it together, right? Okay, togetherness here. And let's just take a look at how we would calculate the predetermined overhead rate and then how we would use it to apply to a particular uh, job here. They're asking me about this particular job that used 1,500 direct labor hours. They want to know the amount of overhead that should be applied. So I have to come up with a predetermined overhead rate, and then I apply it based on, and I guess I'm going to have to base it on direct labor hours because they're telling me how many direct labor hours this job used. So they come over and they tell me, Jonathan Manufacturing adopted a job costing system for the current year. Budgeted cost driver activity levels for direct labor hours and direct labor costs were 20,000 and 100,000 respectively. Now I'm kind of eyeing the hours here because I know I've got to use hours. They tell me that in addition, budgeted variable and fixed overhead are 50 and 25,000 respectively. Now look, I really don't care whether it's fixed or variable for these purposes. I know that these are my estimated, budgeted, my estimated overhead, okay? So 50 plus 25,000 means that I'm estimating, I'm budgeting that I'm going to have 75,000 of these overhead costs that are too difficult by definition. If I'm calling it overhead, it's indirect. By definition, are too difficult to trace directly to the job. Now, they gave me information about the um, actual costs and hours for the year are as follows. And um, they gave me all that information really in no attempt to help me at all. Thanks a lot, CPAs. Man. That does not help me at all because I need to take the $75,000 and divide that by what? Divide that by 20,000, the estimated hours. That gives me the, and I called it a predetermined overhead rate. OH is overhead. Predetermined overhead rate. When I do the math on that, somebody check me to get 375 per direct labor hour? Yes, Professor. Oh, good, $3.75. So now every time the job uses a direct labor hour, I'm gonna apply that much overhead. So I take that 375 times what? This particular job used 1500. I'm going to go ahead and do the math on that. That should give me 5625. Okay, so that's all they're doing. So the trick is what? Use all the budgeted information, come up with a predetermined, and then use the actual amount of hours that any job used to apply it. And that's how you do that. Um, 
when I'm reading this question, I probably never would have come up with that. Um, and so I was wondering if we could just go over what the question actually says for a minute here, because we say budgeted cost driver activity levels for direct labor hours and direct labor costs were 20,000 and 100,000. What is the 100,000? I don't get what that is. Well, if they had told us that this, that they use direct labor dollars as the driver, then I would have taken the 100,000, which was the budgeted um, direct labor um, hours, and I would have divided that by the 75,000. So it's really whatever the problem would have ended up asking me, you know, telling me what they were using to apply the overhead. So at that point, what's that? Somebody help me with that ridiculous. So amount. they would have given us uh, uh, something other than telling us that 1,500 direct labor hours were used. So because they tell us 1,500 direct labor hours were used, that tells us to use the 20,000 instead of the other thing, right? Correct. Yeah, if okay. they, exactly. Yeah, if they had said that there were, you know, 1,500 direct labor dollars, $1,500 direct labor costs, then I would have had to have done this calculation up here that's annoying the hell out of me. 75,000 divided by 100. Good, I'm glad it disappeared. Good, I'm glad to do that. 75,000 by 100,000 was 75 cents per direct labor dollar. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry. It just I I found this con I, I found the language really confusing. Um. <laughs> yeah, that helped me too. Thanks for asking. Well, look, you you got to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think in this case because there's because we're you know new at this uh, or remembering it from a very long time ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's. You know, it it just didn't pop out of me. So, and then there's a lot of extra information. You know. Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not criticizing. I'm saying I'm trying to make the rational point, the test taking point, that I once I'm stuck with the direct labor hours, that kind of drives me from there. You know. You know, at some point, even if you're confused on this question, you gotta swim for the shore, right? <laughs> so instead of telling you. Well, you got 1,500 direct labor hours. Okay, I guess I better roll with that. But just remember how we got here, guys. We got here from a flashcard that should help us. What page were we on now? Right here. Okay, which should help us. We got that flashcard. We know that we should use whatever the estimated overhead costs are divided by the estimated driver. That gives you the rate per um, overhead rate per whatever the unit of the driver is. And then you multiply that out to apply it. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we look at uh, our cost visually, okay, and fixed versus variable cost. Um, they show us how our variable cost, um, you know, go up as our production goes up, okay? And um, I'm not sure what the difference between the first two of these is. Can anyone discern any difference? Oh, one is materials, what the heck, the line's going up. One is materials and one is labor, whatever. Um, and then this is, and so they're telling us, okay, thank you. They're telling us the point here that, and maybe I should just write that, that materials and labor, and maybe that's what I need to be saying here. Okay, thank you, picture, for helping me figure that out what I want to say. Materials and labor are what? Are variable cost. Okay, so when we're dealing with materials and labor, they're variable cost, and that what? They go up the more units you produce, right? But then we have 
fixed cost. Okay, and fixed costs are things like what are and really the fixed costs tend to be the others that constitute mm -hmm. my um, my indirect cost, right? So notice that my direct cost tend to be what tend to be variable. Indirect cost. are often fixed. And let's go back through our list of fixed costs quickly. So depreciation tends to be fixed unless you're using units of activity method to calculate your depreciation, then somebody might say, well, then it's variable. Okay, but for our purposes, depreciation tends to be fixed. Rent on the factory building tends to be fixed. And then someone's gonna say, yeah, but during COVID there was a non-evict. Non, uh, so because of that, then maybe, you know, our, our factory is, uh, our rent is variable. Okay, we're not gonna get into, you know, those sort of things. Here in the CPA exam, depreciation, rent, factory, okay, rent for the factory, property taxes, okay, tend to be fixed, okay, but you can also have a category of costs called mixed. Mixed costs tend to have what? Both variable and fixed components to it, okay? So what happens with the mixed costs, maybe our utilities might be mixed, maybe what? Maybe our, um, well, probably our um, indirect labor and indirect materials, I guess we could say are mixed a little bit. Okay, you could have some fixed and some uh, variable components to that, okay? So when you basically come over and start talking about total costs, notice that you have your variable costs, okay, which are going to be what going up as you produce more units, but the total cost is driven up, driven up by this fixed portion, okay? So what happens if you sit here and you were to then put our sales over here, and this is not a very good chart here, but if you were to put your sales over here, what happens? In here, we're experiencing loss and we start to get into profit, what, up here after our sales exceed our total cost, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about this more later, but you could actually graph your costs by saying y equals mx plus b, or in other words, total cost equals what? Equals total cost equals variable cost times your units plus what? Plus your fixed cost. So you can actually sit there and do what? You can actually come up with a formula for how your total costs are going to behave. And if you do that, once you kind of graph this out, then you can observe your units and your total cost, the units being the, um, the independent variable and your total cost being the dependent variable. And you can literally sit there and do a regression analysis to predict how your total cost will move when you uh, have additional units. So remember we said, I called it the estimated 
overhead cost, you could sit here and look at your overhead cost is essentially doing this. Your overhead cost has some fixed components, have some components that might be mixed, might be a little bit more variable. And you could sit there and predict how your overhead costs are going to, going to move, create this equation for it, and sit there and use regression analysis, if you wanted to be that sophisticated, as to how your overhead costs are going to move based on the driver and use that to come up with your predetermined overhead rate. Okay, But at this point, all we're talking about is how our costs move, they what how they behave probably is a better way. Variable costs increase as the units increase. Fixed costs stay the same regardless of the units. Okay. Now you come over and they start talking about our variable costs. And again, direct materials, direct labor. Let's just think about those as our um, variable costs. And they tell us that what? variable costs change in total, but they remain constant on a per unit basis, okay? Flashcard that because that's an old exam trick. That's been around back when I took the exam, right? It almost sounds like a way that you would kind of tease somebody that doesn't understand accounting. You'd say what? Variable costs are what? Are variable in total, but they're fixed per unit. Sounds like you're messing with somebody when you say that, right? But that's essentially how that works. So flashcard that. Then they tell us that fixed costs do what? Within the relevant range, the fixed cost does not change when the cost driver changes. Now, when they say within the relevant range, that means that is assuming we still have production capacity. That says, and I'm just gonna read that out to you because I don't feel like erasing it or rewriting it. Assuming we still have production capacity is that last word, production capacity. What are they saying? If you've reached the capacity of the factory, well, now your fixed costs are not fixed anymore because what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to go rent another factory. You're going to have to build another factory, whatever. So when we're talking them within the relevant range, we're saying, hey, you're still, you know, having some sort of capacity for production essentially is what they're saying there. Okay. Now, what's interesting here and what you should flashcard is fixed cost then. Fixed costs remain constant in total, but they vary per unit, okay? So our total fixed cost will be the same, but as we produce more units, our fixed cost per unit will what? Come down, or if we produce less units, our fixed cost per unit will do what? Will come up, okay? Question on that? Okay. Not a question, but I think if you think of fixed costs as a step function over, over the long run, uh, because you hit a plateau while you have remaining co construction capacity or, or production capacity, but then you have to make a big investment in doubling the size of your plant when you run out and then you're flat for a while and then it jumps up. So if you think of it as a step function, that might help. It might help what? Oh, because, because in the long run, all costs are variable because, okay, ne forget what I said, Never mind. Okay, the reason I'm saying my help what I'm just, you know, we're trying to pass the exam. And I don't want to get someone to get into a situation where they don't know what relevant range means. Okay, because you're looking at this question, then all of a sudden I haven't mentioned relevant range. So you're like, well, what is relevant range? And that's essentially assuming that you're not having to add capacity by like you're saying, having this, you know, big step up where you're having to buy a new factory or something. So I understand what you're saying, but I'm just trying to keep us, when you say help, the main takeaway right here is that the behavior of the variable and fixed cost, variable costs, what, stay the same per unit, but they vary in total, whereas your fixed costs stay the same in total, but they vary by unit, that's all, okay? And the, when we talk about fixed costs, 
And the only reason I point out, uh, Kathy, the point about relevant range is it's in questions. And then all of a sudden, someone doesn't know what relevant range means. Okay, all right, good. So, um, and I think this is what you were just saying down here. And so you can go ahead and flashcard that if you would like, and yeah, you can kind of point it to that example, which is trying to get to that point I think that you were trying to make. Okay, that you were making. Okay, you were trying to make it, you made the point. Okay, all right, good. So let's just go over um, and uh, you can have semi-variable or mixed costs. And I already gave you some examples. I just want you to understand that these tend to be indirect. Okay, all right, good. I'm not gonna go through um, these examples of which ones are variable, which are fixed. I think, you know, you're kind of getting that. And again, they mentioned this point about relevant range here, which we've already talked about. Okay. Okay, great. So um, this thing here is pretty good and that it puts the cost into whether they're variable fixed or mixed, semi-variable. What you can do with this chart here, I'm not going to sit here and read these off to you, but you can certainly sit here and shrink this down to flashcard size. That way you, when you're getting ready for your exam, the day of your exam, you're going to take your exam, your flashcards with you. You're going to go to the exam site and you're going to sit there and you're going to do one last round with your flashcards in the parking lot. You're going to get there about an hour early. So you can go one last round with your flashcards, right? Okay, and this will be shrunken sitting there in your BEC flashcards. So you get a nice quick little refresher as to what costs typically are considered variable, fixed versus uh, mixed or semi-variable. Also, it does a nice job doing what? Calling costs out into whether they are uh, selling an administrative, thus meaning you can actually add this to the flash card. I haven't thought of this. These are what period cost, and these up here would be what product cost. Product cost or what direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. Okay, question. All was right. That, was uh -huh. that last thing you say, DMDL, and what's that uh, last little piece? OH, overhead. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this question. I'm going to do this one together too, guys. I mean, it's almost like a waste of time to put up the poll. Okay. If a product required a great deal of electricity, to produce and crude oil prices increase, which of the following costs would most likely increase? Okay, actually, I'll let you do this one. I thought it was a little more definitional than that. So let's do our let's do our poll. I'll let you have some time with this one. I mean, I almost feel like you got to be living on some part of the East Coast to answer this question, but okay. Some places still burn crude oil for electricity, although that's happening less and less. Of course, you know, if Joe Manchin has his way, we'll just be burning coal forever because I live in West Virginia and I got to go in, in mine coal like my granddaddy did because my granddaddy died of black lung disease and I need to too. Um, <laughs> you know, so I'm of the opinion we should abolish the Senate. <laughs> but anyway. I'm glad you explained the East Coast thing, because when I looked at that as a native Californian, I went, what the hell does electricity and crude oil have to do with each other? Well, and that's becoming, and, and this, I'm suspecting, Kathy, was a question that was released before 1996. 
And so that means that this same exact question could still appear on your CPA exam. And so I have a feeling that's why Becker's putting it here uh, as part of our lesson. But the reality is even in the, you know, some of these places that used to burn crude oil for electricity, they finally aren't doing that anymore either. You know, there's really absolutely no reason for us to use fossil fuels anymore for anything. I mean, we've got these vehicles now that are, you know, an electric vehicle is faster than a, than a gas powered engine. You know, the only thing I wish they would do is make it a little louder because when I step on my gas, I like to hear sound. But other than that, it's faster than, you know, there's no reason that we need to be polluting the air anymore. We're just, the only reason we do it is pure politics. It's pure politics. It's supposed to be, well, I'll lose my job if you get rid of coal mining. Well, how about this? How about we create a situation where communities that used to mine coal, those places are going to produce, how about something stupid like medical supplies? How about that? Instead of buying them all from overseas, how about produce them here? Now we've got control over something that we need if we have a disaster, a medical, you know, pandemic type thing, whatever you want to call it, a health, med, uh, what do they call it, public health crisis. You Now you're producing the stuff you need for that here and you're making less people sick by breathing in bad air. How about that? Okay, anyway, end of speech. Um, that one anyway. And so let's go ahead and let's look at this question. And um, yeah, okay, good. Everyone got this right. Conversion costs are what? Our uh, direct labor, which is not relevant here, but also what? Our overhead. And so if we're sitting here and our electrical costs are going up, then our overhead is probably going up. Therefore, our conversion costs are going up. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at uh, module two. Are we doing on time? We're good on time. So we can jump in to module two, okay? And we're going to talk about cost accumulation systems. And when we talk about cost accumulation systems, we're really going to be talking about job order costing and process costing. Again, cost accumulation systems, guys. So we're still, we're talking about now in BEC, all of a sudden we've shifted from all these analysis that maybe wouldn't even be being done by the accountants. And now we're back firmly in the accountants world where we're sitting here and we're saying, hey, we're a manufacturer and we're gonna use cost accumulation systems, cost accounting systems to gather our costs, okay? Now we have this cost of goods manufactured, okay? And our cost of goods manufactured is going to be a debit to work in process and a credit to finished goods. By definition, the cost of goods manufactured, put it in a T account, is when you finish, FG is finished goods. When you finish a job, you do what? Eh, really? Really, John? God damn, I hate when I do those kinds of things. And it bothers me because I've only been an accountant. I've only been studying accounting for 40 years. So it may take me a little bit longer to figure this out. Okay, so it is a debit to what? Uh, to finish goods, a credit to work in process. In other words, what it is, is the amount of work that we have finished for the period. Once something is not a work in process anymore, what do you do? You take it out of work in process and you put it into finished goods, okay? That's it. By definition, cost of goods manufactured, I'm gonna say it again, is the amount that comes out of work and process and goes into finished goods. In other words, it is the what? 
it is the cost of goods that we have finished for the period. Okay. Now, what do you debit? So let's do cost of goods sold. What do you debit when you have sold something? Cost of goods sold. Good. You debit cost of goods sold. What do you credit? Finished goods. Well, you credit inventory. And since we're dealing with a manufacturing entity, you're right, we would credit finished goods, wouldn't we? Okay, so that means, guys, that the cost of goods sold, I guess I should write credit here. The cost of goods sold is what? The cost of goods sold is, yeah, I got myself stuck with X's and not here. Debit, cost of goods sold, credit, finished goods, in other words, I'll put my finished goods first. It's the stuff that you sold, isn't it? Comes out of finished goods inventory and goes into cost of goods sold. And it's kind of like, okay, John, well, what's the flash card? I'm not gonna have you flash card that the cost of goods sold is the cost of goods sold. It's what goes into the cost of goods sold. What you debit the cost of goods sold, that's cost of goods sold, right? I don't think we need a flashcard, but flashcard, the cost of goods manufactured by definition is what comes out of work in process and goes into finished goods. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, let's just take a look here. And we have our cost of goods manufactured. So we know by definition, that's going to be the stuff that is going to what? Uh, is going to come out of work in process, right? Now we have beginning work in process. We add direct materials, we add direct labor, we add manufacturing overhead applied for the period. What do we call that? What do we call these? Direct materials? Product costs. Good, these are product costs. Any other name for them? How about? Conversion then? cost? Huh? Uh, conversion cost? Well, no, direct materials is not a conversion cost. All right. Direct materials, I mean, if you wanna do that, direct materials and direct labor would Prime cost. Wouldn't it be a mix of prime and conversion costs? Well, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. And direct, direct materials and manufacturing overhead are what? Our conversion costs. So yes. This is what I'm talking about, guys. This is what gets difficult is this different names for the same thing. I mean, look at this. We've got, as Kathy said, prime costs and conversion costs by definition are the same as product costs because product costs are direct materials, direct labor and manufacturing overhead and manufacturing overhead, direct materials and direct labor are also product costs. And they're also called manufacturing cost. Look, guys, this shit was in place before I was born. Don't blame me. You know, I'm just telling you, this is the way they have defined these things. And you got to kind of be comfortable with these different ways that they say different things. Okay. Okay, good. Now what happens then when we subtract off the work in process, the ending work in process, then that's telling you, well, this must be what you subtracted from your um, work in process. By definition, 
what comes out of work and process is credited out, out of work and process goes into what finished goods that's our definition of cost of goods manufactured okay let's look at it another way here's my work in process i need more room but let's see if i can make it work here here's my work in process and it has a beginning balance and the beginning balance they told me is how much 40,000, that's 40,000, okay? And um, then I'm gonna move this debit credit line over a little bit. And then I'm stuck with that, you know, pretend that 40,000 isn't sitting there, okay? And then I do what? I add my direct materials. I add my direct labor. I apply my overhead, right? And then when I'm done with my work for the period, when I finish my work in process, I do what? I credit work in process. And what do I debit? Cost of goods sold. Finished goods. Finished goods. I debit finished goods, good. I debit finished goods for 150,000, right? And then the ending balance, would be what, 10,000? Yes. Those little dots are zeros. 10,000? Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, guys, by definition, cost of goods manufactured is essentially what comes out of work and process. Now, to calculate my cost of goods sold, let's go ahead and stick with that T account. Uh, theme. Okay. Cost of goods sold. Okay. Now cost of goods sold. Um, well, I'll put cost of goods sold. Yeah. Let's do it this way. I want to put finished goods here. Okay. Finished goods. They're telling me how to beginning balance of what? 20. And then they're telling me that what my finished goods, I guess I could have keep kept going up there, had the what had the 150,000. That's that number right there that I probably could have just kept going with that T count up there. And then we had what and then we had um, our cost of goods sold, which is 120,000. So that's the stuff we sold. And therefore we should be left with what? With 50,000, okay? Now, um, of course, what we credit to finish goods gets debited to, what account is this? Cost of goods sold. Good. Okay. Okay, so they're showing you in that format the relationship that we really already have talked about on the previous page, and I asked you to flashcard that. Okay, okay, good. So we're going to look at two systems, job order costing. Job order costing, we keep track of our cost for each job, okay? And it's basically, when we are producing per order, hello, job order costing. So somebody says, hey, John, build me a bookcase, which by the way, don't ever ask me to build you anything, okay? If you do, you're in trouble. You're, whatever it is I build for you will fall apart before you ever come to get it, okay? So anyway, but you say, build me a bookcase. So I'm gonna say, okay, how tall do you want? How wide do you want? How many shelves? and I'm gonna build it to your specifications, okay? That's typically the kind of thing that you're gonna be using job order costing for. We're going to talk about process costing and with process costing, we're developing homogeneous goods. We're developing cornflakes. Every box of cornflakes is exactly the same. Now, sometimes people say, well, what if it's frosted flakes? 
Well, that's a different batch, different type of cornflake, but every box of the regular old unfrosted cornflakes should be exactly the same. That's process costing. We use a process costing system for that. But things that we're building to specifications, we call that job order costing, okay? Now we've already talked about how to apply overhead. And so I don't see that we need to repeat this question. I think you get that point, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna come over and let's just take a look at these T accounts together. And I kind of contemplate doing this at the beginning because I think it helps to set the scene for some of the other things that we have already talked about. But then I found that if I just start with this, people's head explode in the first five minutes of class. So I'm always on that fence. So should I do it at the beginning or should I do it at the you know, point where it's in the book? So I went this time, we're doing it at the point where it's actually shown in the book. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. And we have raw materials and we have raw materials, okay? And they don't show the debit to the raw materials here. But if I acquire raw materials on account, okay, then I'm going to credit an account and I'm going to debit my raw materials for the things that I purchase. If I'm acquiring something on an account, what is the credit here to this T account I wrote up here in blue? Transferable. Yep. AP. Good. Good. Excellent. Good. Just want to make sure we're kind of remembering our accounting here. So we credit accounts payable. We debit raw materials for the stuff we bought, right? Mm -hmm. Now we've already seen that materials could be direct or they could be indirect, right? So what happens? We're sitting here. And if it's a direct material, we debit it to work in process. If it's an indirect material, following that little red arrow down here, notice we do what? We credit it to the manufacturing overhead account. We can't put it straight to work in process because it's too difficult to track the indirect materials by definition to each job. And we're trying to gather the cost of a job right here, aren't we? Okay, but we'll get it there. Don't worry, we're gonna get it there, okay? Now, what happens? Then we go ahead and we have our wages payable. Now, when we have our wages payable, if it's what, direct labor? Again, it goes up to my buddy work in process because it's direct, I can easily trace to the job. If it's indirect, it goes to what? Manufacturing mm -hmm. overhead. Now, this is only talking about manufacturing cost here, but what if it was the CEO salary? Do they pay the CEO? The expenses, g &A. Good, that's gonna go to my admin expense. In other words, the CEO salary gets debited to admin expense, right? And that admin expense gets reported where? Balance sheet or income statement? Income statement. So we're saying that what? This period cost goes straight to the income statement, right? Okay, I'm just pointing out that you could get a question where they're talking about, you know, the wages payable and they talk about the CEO salary being part of that, trying to trick you into thinking that that needs to go to work in process. That is a period expense, right? Goes straight, straight to the income statement. Okay, good. So we've got our direct material. We've got our um, direct labor. How about our manufacturing overhead? We've seen how the indirect labor and indirect material. And just for fun, what were we calling all these? What was our scary term for those? Six. The others. Okay, these are the others. Indirect material, indirect labor, no brainer, that's indirect, right? But then you have these others. Now they're showing these debits over here, but of course you would have what? Down here, say accumulated depreciation. Okay, so that would be the credit 
to the debit what depreciation okay we have what we have taxes payroll and property so we would have taxes what payable and then there's going to be the debit there and so on guys i'm not going to you know put farm property insurance payable you get the point right okay or maybe if we had a prepaid insurance policy we would credit the prepaid and debit the fire insurance on the um, factory building, et cetera. Okay. Okay, good. So now what happens? I'm going to be a little silly here, guys. Okay. What happens? All these indirect costs are trapped in the manufacturing overhead account going, hey, we want to be in work in process too. <laughs> Why can't we be in work in process? We tell them, don't cry. We take the predetermined overhead rate, and what do we do? We apply it to work in process using that predetermined overhead rate, whatever it was. And when we do, we will credit the manufacturing overhead and debit the work in process. Now the indirect costs are what? They're in the work in process. And they're happy, aren't they? Isn't that where they wanted to be? OK. Now, the problem that we're going to have though, is that predetermined overhead rate assumes a lot of things. It assumes that our estimate was perfect. Is any estimate perfect? No. You're gonna have actual overhead costs being different from what you had predetermined and whatever your driver is, is going to be different, okay? It's not gonna be perfect further we sat there and we assumed a linear relationship between what? Between the units and the way our overhead costs work. Meanwhile, that relationship may not quite be linear. It doesn't matter. We're not sending rockets to the moon. We're not building bridges. It doesn't matter. If I end up with an under or over applied overhead, I can fix it, no problem. If it is what? If it is under, applied, does that mean that the debit or the credit is going to be bigger? And so my total is 100 and I've only applied 90. So the balance in here, let's say I'm just making this up for the under applied is going to be what? 10. A 10. 10 here, right? So what do I do? There's no problem. God invented journal entries to fix these kind of problems. I simply do what? I simply credit this now it's balanced out to zero and i can debit work in process or if i wanted to i could allocate it between work in process finished goods and cost of goods sold because that's where these costs are going based on the relative balance that's in each one of them so if each one of them had one third i put one third of this in the work in process for a debit one third of the finished goods for a debit and one third of the cost of goods sold based on the ending balance, respective ending balance in each one of those accounts. But it's, I mean, guys, it's accounting. We fix everything with a pen if there's something that's out of whack at the end, okay? Now, if it's the other way, okay, now let's say that we've over-applied. Over-applied means we applied more than the actual. Okay, so now what? Well, now we debit the what? The, uh, I guess I'll write it up where I wrote the other one. We debit it here, right? We debit the manufacturing overhead and we credit the work in process, the finished goods, the cost of goods sold because we put too much in there and we're taking it back out. Nobody dies. There's no disasters that happen. And, you know, all we were doing was during the year using the predetermined overhead rate to apply to jobs. So we knew what our cost of goods sold was associated with those jobs as they were completed. At the end of the year, if it's not, now look, we don't want it to be, you know, I was auditing you and then I saw an under and over applied amount. It was this huge material amount. I'd say, you need to get busy and fix that, you know, uh, predetermined overhead rate. But if it's a little bit off, we simply close it out accordingly and we move on. 
Okay, so now we've got what? Now we've got our beginning balance. There it is, guys. Again, that term, manufacturing cost got added. There it is again, guys. Definition, I'm telling you, simple, def straight, uh, you know, I'm not saying simple, but, you know, written in stone definition. There is no compromise on this. What comes out of work and process goes into finished goods. We call that cost of goods manufactured. What comes out of cost of goods, uh, finished goods and goes into cost of goods sold is cost of goods sold, hello. Okay, question. All right, here, that's a good point for a break. We're gonna take a break right now. And then we're gonna go to talk about our process costing, which is I've already said, uh, really applies to if we're dealing with large number of homogeneous goods. For example, we're producing box after box of cornflakes. Okay, so I'm showing about 620. So let's go ahead. It's a little later. I was 625. Let's let's do 635. Okay. I'm gonna pause it. Somebody remind me. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started back. And uh, I've started the recording again. I think you heard her. And uh, before we get into formally in the discussion of process uh, um, costing, um, I wanted to, we, you know, we showed you these T accounts over here, these different accounts raw materials, work in process, finished goods, and then of course, how that relates to cost of goods sold. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure why they stuck this down here as a pass key, because it basically um, is showing you the same thing that we talked about in the T accounts, um, but now it's showing you in terms of just a calculation uh, approach, right? In which you have your beginning inventory, for your raw materials, you add what you purchased, you subtract the raw materials used, that gives you the ending inventory. Beginning work in process, you add your, again, we've said this a number of times now, you have your manufacturing costs, I'm just gonna call those man costs, okay, for short. Okay, those manufacturing costs come in, that gives you your work in process available, subtract your finished goods, uh, subtract inventory transfer to finished goods. What do we call that? Cost of goods manufactured. Good. Cost of goods manufactured. Okay, I'm kind of holding you to know those things. Okay, right, that goes in to finished goods, what's available, subtract cost of goods sold, and then gives you the ending uh, inventory for your finished goods. And of course, that's your cost of goods sold, right? Okay, so that kind of shows you, um, you know, how those things flow um, using account analysis format rather than T accounts. Okay, so flashcard that. I think that's very useful. Okay, now process costing. And um, we are going to look at a production report. And the only reason we're going to look at the production report here on the next page is I just want you to be comfortable with this silly little thing. Um, just in case the examiners refer to it, you know what they're talking about. Okay, so what happens? You have your... Um, in process beginning, you have goods either transferred in from one department to the next, or it could be what started in that department because maybe they're the first department, right? Okay, so the total units that are in that department are 25,000. You transfer 15,000 out. That means there's what still 10 in process and this thing ties out. I don't know. This is like a 1950s accountant's hobby, 
of making up reports like this that tell me nothing other than to know that I've accounted for all the goods that came into a, a department and went out. I guess it makes sense to somebody. I don't much care much about this. I haven't seen a lot of questions um, even dealing with this, but I don't want you to be caught, be caught dead if they refer to a production report, but it's simply a reconciliation for units, a reconciliation for costs. And I'm not gonna go through the cost part because it's the same logic, okay? Okay, good. Now, equivalent units, okay? And you will see, I promise you, you'll have a couple, three multiple choice questions dealing with this notion of equivalent units, okay? And what equivalent units say is, look, if you are not complete with a unit, you're less than 100% complete, we're going to give you credit this period for the amount of work you've done. So if they tell me that I'm 75% complete, then I'm going to take that 75% and I'm going to multiply that by the number of units that were sitting in production. And that's how I will calculate the equivalent units. Okay, so let's just look at this example. And we have what 10,000 units. Okay, we'd like to produce 10,000 units. And um, as far as our direct labor and our manufacturing overhead, what do you call direct labor and manufacturing overhead? What's another name for that? Prime cost. Uh, mm -hmm. Try again. Mm -hmm. Prime cost. Try again. Conversion. Conversion cost. Okay, labor and materials are prime costs. Labor and overhead are conversion costs. So. <laughs> I always say for conversion cost, just think of a bunch of materials laying on the ground and we're trying to convert them into products. So what do we need? We need some people to come and do some work on them and we need a little electricity to shine down and it is converted into a material, I mean, to a product, I should say. And then our material is a prime cost and I don't know why they put labor over with prime. I don't know. I don't know. I, they invented this before. If they had come to me and asked me, I'd say, hey, just don't worry about it. Okay. Just, I get why you call them direct labor and manufacturing overhead conversion costs. I got that. Why are you bringing in this prime cost thing to make things confusing? Okay. Conversion costs. I got it. I get it. Prime costs. I don't know because they got materials and the labor. It's nonsense. Okay. But you could see on the exam where they ask you that, like that one question we're looking at, or if they're telling you that they're hundred percent done as to materials, they may say conversion cost, which you need to know are materials and I mean, overhead and labor are only 75% done. Okay. So if you want the equivalent units, it's very simple. You take the 10,000 and you multiply that by what? 0.75, your equivalent units are 7,500. In other words, you're saying on an equivalent unit basis, you've completed 7,500 units, even though those 10,000 are still in progress. If you've done 75% of the work on those, then you have completed 7,500 units, okay? Okay, good. Now, they use two assumptions here. They use weighted average and they use FIFO. And we're gonna look at both of these and you are unfortunately gonna have to know both of these for the exam. I said, unfortunately, that I wish I could just tell you, hey, just know one, because they don't ask the other, they ask both, okay? All right, good. So let's just go ahead and let's start with weighted average, okay? And let's just go ahead and take a look at the uh, calculation using weighted average. And to calculate the equivalent units, the equivalent units are composed of two elements, units completed during the month. That's beginning units that were already started plus units started and completed during the month. And then units partially completed at the end of the month, okay? And this is where you're going to apply that equivalent unit calculation. Okay. Now, when you look at this um, 
back pattern right here, okay? Let's just take a look and we say, hey, work in process beginning was 100 units and they tell us it is 25% complete. Now, let me tell you right now, that's a trap. That is the exam trying to mess you up to thinking that you should only say, well, this period we must have only completed 75% of the work you're going to give yourself credit for having completed all 100 of those units this period. So they tell me units completed and transferred out is 600. So that includes those what? Those 100 that were already started, right? Because we completed them and transferred them out. And then they tell me the work in process is 200 units, 40% complete. So notice what I do. I take 100% of the units. You just say, wait a minute, John, wait a minute. Don't you have to do an equivalent unit calculation up there on that beginning inventory? No, not under weighted average. Not under weighted average. We simply give ourselves credit for everything we did this period, anything that is that we completed this period, anything that is, well, even if it had started in the previous period, anything that we are still working on, yeah, we give ourselves credit for the percentage there. Okay, so we got that 680. Now you come over and let's take a look at how FIFO differs. Okay, so now with FIFO, notice we had the 100 units and they're telling us that those were 75% complete at the beginning of the year. Now what happens to get the equivalent units or, or not 75% completed, sorry guys, 75% uh, to complete. That means they were 25% uh, complete at the beginning of the year. So that, like it said in the previous uh, information, here now they're telling us we did 75% of the work this period. So for FIFO, you only give yourself credit for the work you did this period. So on an equivalent unit basis, we completed 75. Now this is where you have to be careful. Units completed and transferred out that includes those 100. So under FIFO, you have to what, back out the 100 that you have now accounted for. You said, hey, 25% of that work was done last period. We did 75% this period. So we've already counted for those 100 units. So now we subtract that off. We started and completed 50. And then the way you do the equivalent units for the ending inventory, is the same as we saw for weighted average, okay? Now, that's how you deal with the denominator in uh, calculating your cost per equivalent unit. Okay? May I, I'm sorry. So again? I said, may I interrupt? Yeah. Matt, I don't understand under FIFO is saying 100 units times 75% to complete, but they gave credit for the 25% the 25% that were complete, Where? 75 and not 25. Where did they give? Under the weighted average, they were saying there was 25% that were complete. Well, there's 100%. And then if you subtract 25% that was completed, then that means there's 75%, it's gonna start this now, left to complete. Of course. Right? So then for FIFO, your, your well, work in cap, your- Let the man finish his question, please. I'm sorry. Okay, so 100% minus 25% means that there was 75% left to complete, right? which is what they're saying on the under FIFO, it's a different way of doing it. You only give yourself credit for what work you did this period. So 25% was already completed, then you only did 75% of the work this period, right? Okay, so then we did average that 25% complete was completed last month. It was completed last month, but we give our, correct. It, in both cases, it was completed last month. The difference is the two methods under weighted average, you give yourself credit as though you did that work this period, right? Gotcha, yeah, now I get it. I was reading that 25% complete as in. Well, yeah, they, I don't know why they did that. They should have said 25% complete 
and then showed you a side calculation of how then they take 75% times 100 units to get the 75. So they should have kept the language the same. I got you. You changed up the language on me, okay? All right, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. No, no, that was actually my same question. I was just trying to say, so for FIFO, you start with what you have yet to do on the stuff that you had from the period before. Beautiful, yes. Okay. That's it. Whereas under, under weighted average, because we're trying to get the average of all the costs. So under weighted average, you sit there and you act as though you did all that work this period, even though some of it was done last period. How you treat the ending inventory is exactly the same. Okay, thank you, That's, that was really helpful. Yeah, okay, now, yeah, that, that, they kind of, they, they kind of, jacked up the word. I don't know why they did that. They probably tried to save ink or something. Okay, now that's what? That's the um, denominator. And I do want you to go ahead and flashcard this, okay? Because notice they're telling us weighted average units completed and then the percent that's in the ending working process um, with the beginning with the... Um, FIFO beginning work in process times the percent to be completed. If they tell you 25% complete, then you would need to say, okay, then that means it's 75% to be completed, right? And then the units uh, actually completed. And again, that units completed gets a little bit tricky because you'd have to subtract off any units that were in progress because you already accounted for the equivalent units there in the beginning inventory. And then the way you do the ending inventory is exactly the same. Okay, all right, good. Now, D, that's the denominator. The numerator to me is easy to remember, but flashcarding anyway, okay? Because think about it. Under weighted average, because you're pretending, and this is when we say the cost, now this is the dollar sign part. We've already figured out how to get the equivalent units. But now what dollars should go into the numerator? And because we're giving ourselves credit under weighted average for work that we did in the previous period, then we should include the beginning balance of the work in process plus any current costs added for the period. What costs get added to work in process for the period? What costs get added to work in process for the period? Product costs. Beautiful, product costs. <laughs> or we've also called those manufacturing costs. But it's the direct material, direct labor, and the applied overhead, right? Good. Uh, divided by the equivalent units, we saw how to calculate that. For FIFO, since you're only giving yourself credit this period for the work you did this period, the numerator only picks up the current cost. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's just go ahead and they give us here a pretty decent little example. Okay. And notice, guys, they give us information for the materials, they give us information for the conversion because we're trying to figure out how much costs need to be taken out of work and process. When things go out of work and process, where do they go? Finish good. Finish good. Finish good. Finish good. Finish good. So, you're right. So the whole reason we're doing this stupid thing is to figure out how much have we completed so we know what to transfer out of work and process and finish good. You say, well, John, why don't you just go over there and look and see what products are in finished good because we're manufacturing Pepsi. We've got a vat full of Pepsi. We've got some in cans. We've got some cans that are sitting empty that are yet to have Pepsi in them. And so we're gonna have to do this method to figure out which costs are in finished goods. And then of course, once we figure out what's in finished goods, then once we sell those things, we know what amount to debit to cost to get sold and credit to finished goods, right? Now, if it's materials and conversion costs, what are my conversion costs? <laughs> I'm gonna keep the overhead. Huh? Overhead. Overhead. Yeah. 
direct labor and overhead. Beautiful. Good. I like the enthusiasm. Okay. Now, they give us this information here, guys, and I'm going to focus on the conversion cost part of this because the materials cost part isn't very interesting because in this example, they put all the materials in at the beginning of the process. And so there is really no materials in progress at the end of the year. So it kind of messes up the example, okay? So let's just look and just let's focus, if you don't mind, on the conversion uh, cost, okay? We're gonna do FIFO and we're going to do a average, but I'm gonna focus right here, guys, okay? On the conversion cost. So what happens? Units in process and they tell us that they were 100% complete. So we just go ahead and we give ourselves, well, they don't tell us they're 100% complete. We, we give ourselves credit for 100% because we assume we did all that work this period. Then what? Then they tell us units started and completed are 10. So since we started and completed those, that's the 10,000. And then we have what? We have the 1,600 because the problem told us that there were, um, and the way they came up with the uh, 1,600, the problem told us that there were, what, 2,000 units in progress. They were 80% complete. Okay, so there's our denominator. Then we pick up the cost and we pick up what? And I'm just focusing on conversion here. We pick up those costs that were, the problem told us there was 3,000 in beginning inventory and there was 49,000 in ending inventory. So we have now this total cost of 52,000 that we have for our, um, for our materials, okay? Now what? Now we go ahead and we take, and I'm just going to um, do this for my, I, I guess I can uh, do this for my, um, for my materials, and then we have 15,600 units, I mean, for my conversion cost. And I take what? I take the 52,000 and I divide it by what? By 15,600. And that gives me a cost per equivalent unit of, uh, da, 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 Three, why am I getting it? Sorry. Professor, it's 3.33. Three, three. It, okay, I just want to make sure. I thought I saw something different. Good. I've got this 3.33. Three, three. Now we also can do the same thing for the materials and that we have what? It's just that the equivalent unit production isn't as interesting because we really don't have to apply that 80%. But then you would take the 16,000, you would divide that by what? By into the 25,000, that gives you $1.56. Somebody check the math on that just to make sure I'm not losing my mind here, right? It is correct, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, now what I can do at this point now is I remember the objective and I apologize because when I did my example here that I wrote down, then I started using the materials per unit, but that's okay. The takeaway here for the conversion cost was this calculation equivalent unit. But now that I know my cost per unit for my materials and my conversion cost, I would sit there and I would use those now to move my costs through my work in process, through my accounting system. But I'm just gonna focus on the materials now, okay? So what happens? I sit here and if they have total units of 16 and 2000 are still in progress, then how many units did they transfer out? 14K. Good, they had 16,000 total units. They transferred out what? Two. So that means that there's four, I mean, they still have an inventory of 2000. So that means transferred out is what is the 14,000. So that means that I can, for the materials, take that 14,000 and I come up with the cost 
equivalent cost per unit of 1.56. And when I multiply that out, I get 21,875. Is that what you guys are getting? Correct. Um, 21,840. Well, not quite, because this is one of those occasions where there's a rounding that makes it uh, a little bit different. So if you take the four, if you take um, 25,000 and you divide it by 16,000, I get 1.562. Is that what you get? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you take 1.562. 1.5625 is the way I did it. And then you multiply that by 14,000. Then I get this 21,875. Is that what you get? Yes, Professor. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's just look at it. I'm just trying to show you here more, guys, because I think the exam would probably start stop here. But I'm just trying to give you a little more feel for what the hell, why are we doing this equivalent unit? Thing? So now I'm sitting here, and if I had my work in process, okay, and they tell me that the work in process has a beginning balance. And they tell me that the beginning balance in the work in process is what? Where did they tell me the beginning balance? Beginning balance in the work in process. And again, I'm just doing materials right now. They tell me it was what? A thousand, wasn't it? At May 1st for materials? Yep. Right here. Okay, for materials, I don't need to look at the total. For materials, it was a thousand. So they told me that they had a thousand sitting in there. And then the problem tells me that they added cost of, and the total cost added for the period totaled up to, for materials totaled up to 24,000. Right? So if they added $24,000, now the balance is $25,000. Now I'm sitting there and I'm looking at half done stuff and I'm like, how much is done? And they let me get, get credit for the things that I've completed this period. And according to this, if I've completed what? on an equivalent unit basis, I've completed 14,000 items and I have a cost per equivalent unit of 1.5625, that's telling me that I've completed $21,875 worth of work. That's the amount that's going to come out of work in process, 21,800. I don't know why my pen is doing this to me right at this moment. 20. Have you ever seen a man snap a pen? Because that's about to happen. Because, you know, I mean, this is not the easiest thing for you to follow. And then it's going to go ahead and fuck up right now. 21,875. It's even worse. 21,875 is what that says. That means now that the balance is what? $25,000 minus 21,875. 3,125. Huh? 3,125. 3,125. Good. So now because of this equivalent unit method here, I know 
what to credit to work in process and what to debit to finished goods, 21,875, right? Right? Now, notice the ending balance comes along for the ride. But on the CPA exam, I don't want you to sit, have to sit here and make a whole set of journal entries to figure this out. So what you would do if they asked you, well, what is the ending balance in working process for the materials? You would simply do what? Um, you would simply take the 2,000 units that we've already determined are still sitting in the um, working process, multiply it, and again, this is just for materials, times the 1.5 six, two, five, and that will give you what? 3,125. 3,125, is that what our T account told us it should be? Yes. So you can pretty much confirm, I think it was where I was trying to write that was the problem, sorry. Okay, and so what happens? You sit here and you can confirm what you end up calculating through the journal entries in balance by doing that. Question? Okay, now that's weighted average. Let's look at first thing. What happened to the conversion costs? Ignore those? Okay, well, I don't want to turn this into a three hour example. Oh, okay, but so um, you're just, you would do those separately, right? Because they have different right. amounts and different, okay, so you yeah. would do that separately. You wouldn't like add the, the, the two factors together and then do it. Okay, got it, thanks. Yeah. That was actually my question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, you'd have to do them separately. And I'm sorry, Kathy, I see what you're, I thought you were asking me, why, why did you do it? Um, for the, um, for the, uh, conversion costs, you have to do it separately because they're different equivalent units, right? For the material that's all 100% and for the conversion cost, it was 80%. Um, so I just, but I just ignored because I don't, I don't want to go on and on with this. And I have to remind myself next time because it's a little confusing because I explained the equivalent units here and then I did the accounting with the materials. Okay, all right, but let's look at the equivalent units. And again, it's only interesting as it relates to, well, it's kind of interesting as it relates to materials because notice since they were 100% complete, we don't give ourselves credit for any of the materials. And since we were only 40% complete as to the conversion cost, we only give our credit, self credit for the 60%. We did this period. We give our 100% for the unit started and completed, 1,600 for the units in ending inventory, and then the rest would flow the same uh, once you get your cost per equivalent unit using FIFO. Then you go ahead and notice there is a difference in the cost, then you would apply that accordingly. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at um, spoilage. Okay, now when we look at spoilage, we could have normal spoilage. Normal spoilage, you just consider part of your inventory cost. So whatever you put in and you spoiled so many items, you don't have to call that out separately, okay? Now let's say you have something weird that happened. If that's called abnormal spoilage and that is a period expense. So you really just need to read the question to see what they would be asking you about, telling you about the spoilage being normal or abnormal. If it's abnormal, expensive, expensive. If it's normal, then it's going to be carried through your system as your total cost that you will move from work in process to finished goods to cost of goods sold. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look then at a couple of multiple choice questions. Mm. Now what? Now what? What's wrong? What was that groan for? <laughs> oh, the, no, nothing specific, just like, ugh. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if you've ever done any presenting, but if you are, and then somebody in the audience goes, 
that tends to deflate you a little bit. So is there something I can address? It was not a comment about the presentation. It was a comment about, oh God, I got to do one of these things. <laughs> okay. Oh, so I see. Okay. Oh, the questions? Oh, come on now. This is the best part. This is where you have the most fun. After you're done with the exam, you're going to be sitting there going, uh, geez, I feel empty. Why do I feel empty? Because I'm not sitting here working multiple choice questions. That's why. Okay. So enjoy it while it lasts. I'm gonna give you a little more time for this one, guys. So don't rush. Look through the material, the questions here, the information here, and see if you can piece together what you're supposed to do here. Okay, I'm gonna give you extra time. More than two minutes. Okay, guys, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. Okay, go ahead and make your selection. Okay, and uh, all right, we got 70%, although of the number of people in the class, we only got 10 people responding out of 18. That doesn't make me none too happy, guys. You got to get into the habit of trying these, doing the best you can, and suffering the you know agony of defeat if need be. But don't sit there and just you know cry when you don't understand a question, okay? You keep struggling with it. Remember I gave you the story 
about the crows and the hawks in my backyard all day long they're fighting each other okay now do you, do you rather be a crow a hawk or an accountant okay because if you're a crow or a hawk you're going to fight each other for chicken bones if you're an accountant this is your job right here okay all right so let's just go ahead and let's take a look and i'm going to move the results out of the way i want to be an eagle huh so i want to be an eagle you want to be an eagle yeah Okay. All right. Well, that's all right. I mean, I don't have any eagles in my backyard, so I don't know. <laughs> I was just surprised how good the crows were fighting. fighting. <laughs> and I'm kind of spinning around. So I'm going to mute. There that is. I think they stopped. Okay. All right. Good. So let's go ahead. Just that ambient noise. That might have been you, Cornelius. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's take a look. So they tell us that we have these factory overhead costs. And we know that when we're dealing with factory overhead costs, we have to do what? Come up with the predetermined overhead rate to figure out how we can apply that to work in progress, okay? So if they're telling me that these are my overhead costs, then I know that that is my what? Denominator. Ah my numerator in my formula here, not my formula, but my method for calculating my predetermined overhead rate, right? 320,000. Now all I need to know is, well, what is the driver? And they tell me very clearly here that it's direct labor hours. So I have to pick up the 80,000 direct labor hours that were estimated. Remember the flash card was estimated overhead cost. It was what? It was estimated driver, whatever that is, in this case, direct labor hours. This is direct labor hours. This is a dollar amount, right? So when I do the math on that, I come up with a what? A predetermined overhead rate of $4 per direct labor hour. And then they start asking me about the cost of this particular job, this proposed job here. And so I know from the question that there's direct materials of 4,000. There should never, there should be no way that you pick um, anything less than 10,000 here because you know that in calculating the cost of a job, I have to figure out the product cost. You know, direct labor and direct materials are given to you there. So you shouldn't select A, definitely. And you might be interested in B at this point, but you know that if you've got your direct labor, your direct materials, and they're asking you your product costs, you've left out overhead. I'm just showing you how to kind of almost back into the answer if you couldn't get it. So then they tell me that this job used 2,000 hours, is projected to use 2,000 hours. So if it's projected to use 2,000 hours, then that means that what? That means that my overhead piece of my product cost are projected to be 8,000. And so there's my direct labor. Well, I'm going to put in the direct materials, my direct labor, and now I've got my overhead. I've got my product costs. Answer is 18,000. I guess one comment or question. What confuses me on this one is it says direct labor, 6,000. So I'm assuming basically, I guess I shouldn't assume that that is my, well, that's my direct labor, I guess I still need to do the overhead, just thinking out loud. Yeah, 6,000 yeah. dollars. I think they should have been a little more careful to put a dollar sign since we've got dollars and hours flying around in this question. Yeah. But they were consistent in their format and that they didn't put dollars there either. Okay. Can you get any of the choices without adding that 6,000 as a dollar amount though? No. Anyway. Okay. You know, you kind of start to get used to these things too, uh, the way they present some of the things. So let's look at this question. We're going to do equivalent unit uh, type question now. Oh boy. Equivalent units. I love it.
I should have saved my groan. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, well, you can just feel like that one. You're really not going to like this one. <laughs> I think with these questions, guys, for me anyway, in the BEC sequence of things, I prefer these over, you know, these kind of, well, you know, if the, there's a decrease in the currency, then what does that mean for the seller product? You know, those kind of questions to me are tougher than these because you can kind of practice with these and develop some yeah. muscle tissue around them. Whereas some of those questions, you're just going to have to flash card and rinse, wash, and repeat to you kind of get your brain working in that mode with those. Yeah, I kind of felt that way with like the weighted average cost of capital. Like when I first looked at the formula, like, oh my God. And then when I finally understood it and like kept doing it, I'm like, oh, okay, it's kind of fun. Yeah, when know. there's kind of numbers in there, right? Because yeah, kind of numbers like, people. Yeah. Um, some of those more theoretical ones to me get a little more challenging. Definitely. Yeah, and it'll be like, Did I skip a question? No, not yet. No, I didn't skip it. Okay, never mind. Hey guys, I'm giving you a little more time. We're past three minutes, so you should never work on a question longer than three minutes, ever. I don't care what stroke of genius you're in in that three minute mark. It's time to start to wrap the question up. And on average, you should be about a minute and a half for questions. I think that's where I'm gonna struggle with this exam timing wise is going through these calculations in three minutes. Well, if you think you're going to struggle with that, what is the solution? Practice, practice, practice. Well, practice on that. Um, so um, when I um, tell you, you know, we do the question two minute per question in here, and then when you look at the how to study file, I tell you, hey, don't worry about timing so much the first time you go through these questions. But then by the time you get to the final review and you're working your final exam under exam conditions, that's when you should absolutely be, um, you know, um, burning off any time issue at that point. So it's almost like, you know, you train technique in the early stages and then towards the end, now you start trying to build in speed and how you're gonna compute, you know, what it's gonna be like on competition day, right? That's what we're doing here. So don't worry right now if your time is, you know, more than you think it should be, but yeah, you need to work that out before you get into the exam. And the way you do that is in the final review. And then the real test of that is when you do your final exam under exam conditions. That's when you're going to feel, oh, shit, I'm going too slow. 
I got to, you know, I got to hurry up because I've only got so much time left and I still got to go through my task based simulation. I want you to have had that experience. I don't want that to come up the first time on exam day. Okay, so with all that, let's go ahead and make our selection for this one. And um, see if I can find my mouse to bring this up so I can end the poll. Okay, and um, all right, we did. okay on this. This is kind of a hard question, so I guess that's okay. Let's go ahead and let's go through this one together. Okay, so the answer is B. So let's just take a look at this. Most of us got it right. Okay, 64% of us, whatever. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. So we have this kerner and they give us some information and then they tell us beginning work in process, da da da. And I'm going to jump down. It's FIFO method. So if it's FIFO method, okay, and they tell me beginning work in process was 50% complete for direct materials, which is the only thing I'm working on here, okay, then um, what does that mean as to how much work I did this period? 50%. I did the remaining 50% this period. So on equivalent units, Put EU up here, equivalent units, that's 50, right? Okay. Now, where this question probably gets a little tricky is they give me the information started during the period and completed during the period. And remember, my next step is to get the number of units what that were completed during the period. So there's two ways to look at that. If I sit here, and I say, well, look, the 400 units were completed. That includes what? The 100 that were in progress. So I could take 400 minus 100. That means, because I already gave myself credit for the 50% of the work that was done this period, and I completed the remaining 50% this period, but I don't want to double count those. So I could get the 300 that way, or, okay, I could sit here and say, well, if you started five and you've got what, 200 in progress, well, that means that of the 500 you started, right, there's still, there, um, and there's still 200 in progress, then there's 300 that you completed this period. You can do that either way. Of course, you can put 300 two times and just tell me you can get that 300 those two ways. Okay, so sometimes, guys, you got to read through the question, understand how they're presenting the material, and understand the logic as to how you're getting now the 300 units that were, I'm going to put 100% here. Just to... I'm kind of lost because is it, isn't it the 100 times the 50% that you're subtracting? No. No, because all hundred of those units are now completed. We're, we're already accounted for. 50% last, 50 last period, 50 this period, right? I did 50. I'm not getting this one at all. <laughs> Look, did I do 50 last period? Theoretically on an equivalent unit basis? Yes. Did I do 50 this period on an equivalent unit basis? Well, it's part of the four. It's part of the four hundred. Did I give myself credit for fifty units in that beginning inventory? I don't think so. Well, what does this number here represent to you? Okay, I guess you did. I thought we weren't supposed to count what. This is FIFO. We give ourselves credit for the work that we did this period. We were fifty percent. Complete for materials, which means we did 50% this period, right? I think I thought you don't give yourself materials credit because in the example, they didn't give themselves material credit. That's because they told us materials were already done. Oh. If they tell you the materials are in the beginning of the process, 100% complete as materials, and you don't give your, then, no, then the assumption is 
no work was done this period, right? Okay. So that's why they did that this time. But here, that last time, the example, here, you're saying, well, you completed 50 units last period and you completed 50 units this period on equivalent unit basis, right? So I don't want to sit there and recount those as having been completed because they're included in that 400 and I already counted for them, the 50 and the 50 in the previous period. So I have to subtract 100 to get 300. That's all the work I started and completed the period. Or you could say started during this period minus what's in progress, which means it's not completed and you get the same number, right? Okay, so there's the 300, and then there were 200 units in progress, and that part's pretty easy, I think, for everyone, and that they tell us that what, the ending inventory was 75% complete, so I'm going to take the 0 0.75, the 75%, what's that give me, uh, 150? Yeah, I just got confused about the opening direct materials. Okay. Well, under FIFO, you only give yourself credit for the work you did this period. Under weighted average, you pretend like you did all that work this period. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, if the materials are put in at the beginning of the process, it won't make a difference for weighted average, uh, other than the fact that then there probably would be no equivalent new calculation for the ending inventory because the materials are put at the beginning of the process. But if they give you a percentage and say it's 100% complete for the beginning inventory, then um, you don't assume under FIFO that you did any work. That's how they got that zero in the example. Okay, let's try this one. And again, I'll give you about three minutes for this one, just so you kind of get a sense as to what three minutes feels like for some of these.
Okay, we're at three minutes, 30 seconds. Sorry, I forgot to call you at three minutes. Uh, I'll give you four minutes to work on this question, which is off the scale of how much you should ever give a question when you're actually on the exam. While you're learning, it's okay if you spend more time. Okay, let's go ahead and let's wrap this one up. We're right at the four minute mark now. And so let's take a look. And um, the correct answer is B. So that's pretty good. About 70% of us got it right. This is a little bit of a tougher question, although I did give you more time. Okay, and so let's just go ahead and take a look at this. But B is correct. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay. So the first thing we better figure out, hey, weighted average method. If it's weighted average method, that means we're gonna assume that we did what? All of this work in the beginning inventory, right? We're assuming we did it all this period. So weighted average, you bring that all in. You don't worry about the distractor of they're telling you the percentages. I don't even wanna look at what those percentages are because I don't care. I don't apply any percentage under weighted average. Then they tell me that they started in production 100,000 units. They completed 92,000. Please don't start this pen. They completed 92,000. Maybe my battery's going out of the pen. Maybe that's the problem. They completed 92,000 units. Okay. And the ending work in process is 24,000. And they tell me that they're 90% complete for that for the uh, materials. And since the question is asking about materials, I'm not going to worry. Sometimes with these questions, they might have had a follow on question right after that. You may even see that in your homework that would have considered uh, the conversion cost part of it. Okay. But they're just asking me about materials in this question. So that's all I need to worry about. Now, what happens? I sit here and I look at this, and this is the part that you sometimes have to logic out. Look, if they completed 92,000, okay, and what? And we already, we're assuming we completed those 16,000 there, so we already accounted for those right here. We gave ourselves credit for all that work under weighted average. So I would have to subtract the 16,000 to get what? To get 72,000 for the units completed. Or I could look at it and say, well, look, if you started 100,000 and what? There's still 24,000 that are of those that you started that aren't done yet then you could get the, what? Uh, not 72,000, excuse me, guys, uh, 76,000. You could get 76,000 that way, okay? So you could do it this way, or you could do it that way to get the completed units, whatever makes you more comfortable, okay? Then for the ending, these are the completed. For the ending now, that part's probably pretty easy for us. It's 24,000 times, they said we're what percent complete? Times the 90%. So 24,000 times 0.9 gives me, just take a look at my notes here, 21,600, right? You add those all up, that gives me 113,600 equivalent units. But this question went a little further than the ones just asking us for the equivalent units. Now they want us to give us the price, calculate the price per equivalent unit. And remember, we what? Since we're giving ourselves credit for the um, units that were already in process at the beginning of the year, we pick up the cost of the materials that was in the beginning inventory, and then the cost of materials that were added for the period. That gives me this 54,560 plus 468,000, giving me what a total for my numerator of five, 
560. I divide that now by my equivalent unit calculation, which was probably the hardest, harder part of this problem. And that gives me the answer here, which is 460 per unit. Question? Okay, guys, you got to, you know, kind of get used to these. These are definitely ones that you're going to have to build up some muscle tissue on. Okay, these are a little harder. But the good news is that once you've kind of remembered what I asked you to put on the flashcard about how to treat the beginning inventory under the two methods, and then you work with it on these questions, pretty soon I think you're in pretty good shape to be able to answer all these. Okay. So we should just sort of ignore the started stuff, right? Well, you could if you wanted to, depending on how you're more comfortable. Yeah, you could ignore the started, or you could have said, well, if they started 100,000 and 24,000 aren't done yet, then they've only completed 76. Okay. You counted for the ones that were in beginning inventory right here, right? Or if you want to say, well, completed, well, they completed these 16,000 and I already accounted for the 16,000 up there. So I'm going to subtract it from the completed to get the unit started and completed. That's really the number you're looking for here, Kathy, is the units started. That middle number mm -hmm. started and completed. Okay. And I'm just saying to you, sometimes they'll just call it out. They'll say the unit started and completed. You don't need to do another thing. Okay. But if they sit there and they don't, and that's going to be more the case, I'm just showing you there's two different angles to look at that, to come up with that. One is, well, how many units did they start and how many units are still in progress? <laughs> Subtract the units they started minus the units are still in progress. That's the units started and completed, right? Yeah. If you don't look at it that way or if they don't give it to you they tell you the units completed well that includes the 16,000 that were in the beginning inventory so i've got to subtract that off because i already accounted for those and that works the same under lifo or fifo that middle number the only number that's different is the beginning inventory number mm. <sighs> and, and i only give myself credit for what i did this period under fifo it average, I'd be 10 like I did everything that's great. That's it. Let's not make this more than it is. Trust me, this is infinitely easier than doing a consolidation in FAR. Okay, so, so even though it's hard right now, um, you know, you wash, rinse, repeat. Again, I'm going to use that stupid analogy, but you do that. Finally, you're going, I got this. This is not a game stop, uh, you know, a uh, game over, or whatever, showstopper for you on a CPA exam. Trust me, even though it may seem a little hard right now. Okay. Okay, good. Let's come over and let's talk about uh, activity based costing. Okay. And guys, this is all cost accounting, managerial accounting. I don't know why they are sitting here and trying to tease this out as though, other than they think that if they make the modules shorter, it's easier for you to get through everything. Um, you know, having said that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and give you a break and we're gonna stop there. The reason being, I can't finish module three and there's no sense in me starting mo module three and then you can't do anything with it because you know the questions in module three don't tease out by section. So let's just stop there. I think you've got plenty of work to do completing chapter two, the start of chapter three, modules one and two. We'll pick up here on uh, Monday. We'll finish chapter three on Monday. Okay, question, well, we've got a little time here. Is there a way to manipulate the software other than just going through the multiple choice questions that are in that unit? But if I'm struggling with uh, weighted average per se, to find multiple choice questions that will drill me on that in particular? Uh, I don't know, anybody seeing that feature? 
and I don't mean to, I'm not, I'm not asking that question to the team because I don't think it's a worthy question to me is because I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Let's, uh, let's do a little skeet shooting here with the software. Where's my software? I guess we gotta come over here. Yeah. I'm just gonna, we, we could try it with the other parts, but let's just do PC here. Okay, so we're, let's say we're module three. What is this nonsense? Really? Yeah, you know what my day looks like. I spend more of my day reopening things that I accidentally closed than anything. So I guess I gotta come down here, okay. And you have the different parts. No. Only idea I'm thinking of is that the end, that personalized review, maybe just doing more questions there. Where's that? At the bottom of that same page. That adapt to you engine that stuff down there, perhaps you just if you scroll down a little bit more, you let it lets you select a number of questions for the entire what is this B2. And I guess you just drill drill those as much as possible. It'll give you more and more questions. Yeah, but I think what it's gonna do, so yeah. So you can kind of get into that and then maybe they'll give you a tutorial here, I don't know, um, or PDF guide on how to do that, but even though it's not teasing out the equivalent unit questions, we know those are in module two. So if you mess those up, I think it'll start to populate questions in there and then we can work with these. Yeah, I guess that's the only way that makes sense. Yeah, but the other way that you could do it is just go through to questions, right? Um, module one, module two, right? Questions, multiple choice questions, start. Um, unanswered. Now, if you're missing those, then it'll it'll give them to you that way anyway. See, because it, it flags the incorrect questions. So if you missed all those, then by default, you'll get all those. But here, I haven't done any of these. So I would just, you know, toggle through. There's a FIFO. Yeah, I was thinking that too, but then eventually, like you said in your uh, part of the study, you get used to that question and you just memorize the answer to that question, essentially, as opposed to memorizing the process. But I guess if you keep working and working and then, yeah, you'll get used to it. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, let's say you wanted to do these now while it's still fresh or something, but yeah, um, you really should be taking the approach of, okay, I mean, the approach that you should really be taking in all of this, how do I get back now? Please don't take me somewhere else, okay. So the way you should really be working these is, for example, module one, module two. You should be making the flashcards, say for module one, memorizing the flashcards for module one, working the multiple choice questions for module one. If you get 75% or more on those module one questions, you've done your job for module one. You move on to module two and so on like that. If you're under 75%, then you need to start to say, well, why did I miss those questions? Okay, I still don't quite understand equivalent unit and how to handle the beginning inventory. I'm gonna add this thing to my flashcard that helps me with that. Okay, John told me to flashcard this, but I'm gonna put a couple more things in there. Get that down, get that in your head. And then when you come to this thing and it says, you know, do you wanna work, um, you know, the incorrect questions, you would click that. Yes, 
incorrect questions. And now we've addressed whatever the problem was with those questions because you put in some flashcards or did some more thinking about how to get that in your head, whatever for those. And now with a fixed, you know, uh, problem in your whatever was wrong with why you're missing those, now you go back through those with improved technique. And my experience is that then your percentage goes up for those questions. And if it goes to 75, put those away. Don't look at them anymore. Then what you've got is a set of flashcards that are helping you with B2. Some that came with the book, some that I've told you, some that you decided to put in there on your own. So then when you do the final review, remember it's a couple of weeks before you're gonna take your exam. So when you do your final review, you're gonna work all the multiple choice questions in the homework again. Go through the flashcards, refresh your memory, work the multiple choice questions again. At that point, we left it at say 75, you're gonna to go to 80, 85% on those questions. Then what's gonna happen? You're gonna work through all those questions, 85, 90%, you're getting those. Then you're gonna take the final review product. Don't forget, you've got a whole nother set of questions that come with the final review that you've got as part of your package. You'll work all the final review questions. Now you're gonna get about four days before your exam, three or four days before your exam, and all you're gonna do is go through those perfected flashcards again and again and again that have reinforced all the things you need to know. Some people say the last day before your exam, walk in the park. I don't care if you walk in the park as long as you got your flashcards, okay? Bring them with you and keep going through them again and again and again. Drive to the exam site, park your car, get there an hour early, one more round with the flashcards and go in at that point. That's what we're doing here. There is, I do not believe in a method that sits there and keeps working the questions over and over and over again. Oh, and I left out in that formula, you also going back before you, you know, went to the exam site, obviously, you would need to work one of the three final exams you have under exam conditions. That means you set aside four hours with nobody bugging you. And that's when you're really working on how it's going to be on exam day in terms of timing, how you're using. At that point, you use the on-screen calculator. You're limiting your scratch paper availability. All of that starts mm -hmm. to come into play during the final exam that you're working. So I just think it's a little difficult to imagine that you could go through all that and not either pass the exam or see a score that is very, very close to passing. You know, you say, well, thanks a lot, John. Well, look, the beauty of a score that's very, very close to passing, especially the first time you take one of these four exams, is that now you've gotten over the rookie mode. You know what it's like to go to the exam site or all that is now been taken care of. And just by the fact that you're taking the exam a second time, although you should still repeat the final review process. But by that time, you know, you probably just by taking the exam a second time, you're gonna pass. So I, that's why I tell my students six to nine months to pass this exam, uh, to pass these exams. The nine comes in if you don't, if you have a false start on that first one because you weren't quite ready and now you know what you gotta do and you go from there. The only other thing I see sometimes and I never understand this. I get students that pass three parts and can't pass the fourth. And that is something that you need to talk to, um, you know, a, a head doctor about because that starts to become, you know, what I have found is a fear of success thing starts clicking, you know, somewhere, some point, somebody hurt you and told you that you're never going to become anything and that's coming in more than, than anything and my answer to that problem is you should then double down your efforts and everything that i've told you when you've got one more to go 
that's the time that you refuse, you refuse to not finish this thing at that point in time. And that's where you start doing everything you can. I passed three parts. I took the business law section last, and that was my highest score on the four parts of the exam. The reason was there was no way in the world I was not going to pass that last one and go past three of these. So usually, what percentage uh, to pass that exam? So, like, what's what's the percentage usually? Um, what for scores did I get? No, no. What's the percentage usually um, the people who pass the, the exam? The average score? I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't heard that. I got a um, 84 on financial. I got a, at that point, what was sort of equivalent to reg, I guess. I got an 80 on that. I got um, a 75 on auditing. And the reason I got a 75 on auditing is because they had a statistical sampling question in there and I had given up on understanding statistical sampling. I understand it now, but at that point I just, I couldn't get it. And here comes a full 10 point question on audit sampling. And I'm here to tell you that anything you don't study will be on your exam, okay? So here's a 10 point audit sampling question uh, and I just had given up on that. But I, because I kicked ass on the multiple choice questions, and I know I did because in those days, you get, get to bring your booklet out with you. And you would have circled what, quest, what your choices were for the questions. And then Becker, who would also be able to get that booklet, would send you in the, in the mail a listing of what they thought the answers were the question. So as soon as you got that, the first thing you did was bust out your test booklet. I was scoring 95% on the multiple choice questions. And so I bombed on the uh, audit sampling question, but it saved me. Uh, I got a 75 on auditing. And then as I mentioned, I got the highest score on what then was business law, which I got an 89 on that. That was not because I understood that material better than the rest. It was because they would have to kill me for me not to pass that last part. I would rather have died than not pass that last part. And that's what I'm saying about when you get to that last part and you start not being able to pass it, that's when you got to go crazy. What does Prince say? When the elevator goes to bring you down, go crazy. At that point, that's what you got to do sometimes to get past that. Another quick question. Um, when you say six to nine months, is that like working full time too or allow more time if you are full time? Well, to be honest with you, the six to nine months works in the schedule that I originally contemplated for this program, which, yeah. is, two, which is two um, classes per uh, seven and a half oh. week term. Mm -hmm. um, now that they've gone to it. the 15 weeks, uh, I haven't thought through yet, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just curious. Yeah. And then... uh, but, you know, the thing is this 18 months thing that they talk yeah. about, that's nonsense because there's no reason that it should take you 18 months to pass yeah. one of these exams, um, you know, and I used to always... I would go to these uh, debates with other review courses and they would always start to talk about, well, 18 months and they give you 18 months and they made it all about the 18 months. And then one time the person that was speaking against me said, well, let's say you're going to a lot of weddings over the summer and therefore you can't study and you need more time. And I'm like, I don't care if it's your own way. I don't care if you have to put your flashcards on your new partner's head you know <laughs> there's no way that you're going to sit there and let these things stop you from completing this in 18 months so um 18 months is kind of a kind of a yeah. what do they call that a not a red herring but a false mm -hmm. goblet or something I don't know what and then i guess one other thing so i got my notice to schedule would three weeks from after this class ends 
Do you think that is enough time? It's definitely enough. It's bordering on more than enough. Is it? Well, well okay. Well, the reason I say that is um, inefficiencies start to creep in if you give yourself too much time. Yeah. So I like it to be a little crisper time period. It's mm -hmm. okay. Three weeks is okay, but I would yeah. be longer than that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular section that more people have trouble with? FAR. Oh, really? FAR is seen as the kind of the weeder, if you will. Uh, the reason being that it is um, 10, you know, if you look at the Becker books, it's 10 chapters of material. None of the other books have 10 chapters. Okay, so it's a much broader exam. So FAR tends to be the one that chokes off folks. Um, but I often, you know, kind of do the old doctor visit, where does it hurt thing? And that, you know, some people are auditors. And so audit is so easy for them. FAR is easy for them, but because they've crossed out taxes, in their mind and regulation starts becoming harder. For tax people, they've crossed their auditing off in their mind is something that they need to worry about. So maybe auditing becomes the one. Um, I don't get that with BEC too much. I did have one student who couldn't pass BEC. She could not pass BEC and she started losing parts of the exam. Because if you don't finish, all the remaining three exams, 18 months from the day you finished your first exam, you lose that first exam. And she couldn't pass BEC. So she lost like FAR and had to pass FAR again. Couldn't finish BEC, so she lost REG and had to take REG again. <sighs> Passed REG, couldn't pass BEC, had to take audit again. I think passed BEC and then had some problem where she couldn't finish. I think that poor student of mine passed all four parts of the exam twice <laughs> by the time she got there. Education. That's why I'm saying no, hell no. If they, if you pass three parts, you should be a maniac about that last part. I mean, you need to catch on fire before you let that last part of the exam go. I'm sorry. There is no way you let that go at that point. Absolutely not. That is unexcusable in life. I mean, to me, that's like, I don't know. I call it that, that, that self-inflicted damage you do to yourself at that point. I, I don't know what's going on in a situation like that. And I have had a couple of students that have been like that. And I just... I tell them, get your ass in there and pass that last part of the exam. I don't want to hear any more. So. So what was that time period you said that you lose the uh, credit for a, an exam that you had already had? 18 months. So if you passed, uh, I'm going to make the months easy on me. If you pass, say, uh, BEC on January 1st, 20, let's just use 2021 you would have until June 30th, 2022 to remain, to finish the remaining three parts. If you don't, then you lose that first part. And now the clock is running for you to finish the part you couldn't pass plus repass BC in that example before the 18 month clock on the second exam you pass runs. Do you have to know anything about how the testing centers are functioning during COVID? Because um, you know now we've got the Delta variant, right? When we thought we were getting into the clear here. Uh, I think it, you'd have to look, but I think it's similar to everything else. Mask. Sit further apart, that kind of thing. Yeah. Probably social distance. The probably and you have to wear a mask. Huh? You just have to wear a mask, but everything is pretty much the same. Okay. They're probably going to wipe down 
your station after you're gone, you know, after you're done, which is none of your, none of your worry. Uh, instead of handing those plastic boards out, they hand out scratch papers. Are they still doing that now, even after the? Um, yeah, you just get scratch paper and then you get your own pen and like your key thing for your locker and that's it. But there's no plastic board or anything. Yeah, for a while they were using those dry erase boards. We actually couldn't even erase them. For years they were doing that. Um, but I think they got away. You know, some of the things that people come up with are ridiculous, you know. Um, they, for a long time, gave you a board that you couldn't erase and they wouldn't give you paper. And once you filled up both sides of it, you had to raise your hand and ask for more for another board. Um, whereas now I think they just give you paper. So professor, if, if for, um, for any reason we don't pass the BEC, is it still we can take the auditing test or it depends? Yeah. No, it's not like it's not like the CFA okay. charter financial analyst exam. You can't go to level two until you pass level one. You can't go to level three until you pass level two. Mm -hmm. No, you can just go and take the next one. Okay. And for if you repeat the exam, is it free or you still pay for the fees? No, oh, you gotta pay. You gotta pay to reapply. <laughs> But this time it's only 50 bucks instead of 100, and then you got to pay for that exam section to take it again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? No, thank you. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting. I'll post up the recording here pretty quick. Okay. And Thanks. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.